Hello there and welcome my fellow FileMaker friends, fans, and developers. This is Matt Petrowski bringing you FileMaker tutorials over at FileMakerMagazine.com. In this video, we are taking a look at a little bit of what I call Understanding FileMaker 12. And I'm going to be working with layout objects. Now this is not a blatant promotion of my upcoming release of the Theme Studio for FileMaker 12, but it is something where I will be using that tool to show you what's going on. That's because I created the tool more or less for myself so that I can create the themes that I release through the tool. Let's take a look at FileMaker 12's layout objects. All right, there are a number of things that I want to cover in this video, and I'm going to try to make it so that it's not too long, but there's definitely enough. Now, in the DevCon sessions that I'll be speaking at at this year's DevCon, I'm going to ta be talking about aesthetic design, the actual visual design of layouts, both for FileMaker Go and for uh, regular desktop FileMaker. What I have on screen right here is a copy of my theme studio within its developer mode. But what I want to talk about are FileMaker 12's layout objects, how they relate to FileMaker 12's themes, what's going on behind the scenes, and give you a really good solid understanding. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move through the interface and as I do you're going to notice some big differences. For example, here I have this little icon and you'll note as I zoom in when I click the icon, note that I get the recessed look when I click that icon. Now the same thing as I move down here at the bottom is right here. Not only do you see that when I hover over it, I get the slight change, but when I click, I get that nice little shadow and I get the indication of a depressed look. Uh, not that the button is depressed, but I have pressed it down, making it depressed. Okay enough of the jokes. Um, what we have as well with regards to icons in particular is a really nice feature wherein you notice that I have these two icons right here. When I hover, notice that I get a very subtle shade right there and then when I click I get a darker shade. That is very much a uh, UI specific type of thing. You note that when I click on this object, even if the object itself is an actual rounded corner rectangle or in this case it is a circular button what you need to know is that there are things that you need to do in your FileMaker 12 interface that are a complete and utter transition from what we were doing before. In fact, you notice as I hover, I'm not getting the hand cursor icon. That's something that FileMaker has had turned on for a long time. You notice that I do have it right here, but that's because in this particular case, this button... I need people to know that this is not just an iconic representation. So when you choose to use the hand versus not is going to be something that you need to decide to do, but for the most part, because of the hover effect that we have, such as on this delete button, you can make your applications look really nice. In fact, you notice up here in this main area where I go from icons to layouts. Note that I am actually giving the hover of the areas, but when I click, I get this nice recessed look where it looks like I'm pressing on the button. Now, all of that is stuff that you cannot currently do in FileMaker 12. Hence the reason for showing you this is this little tweak tool that I'm going to walk through where I'm going to use it to give you an understanding of what's going on behind the scenes. But there's all kinds of things. For example, this checkbox. I don't have a press state, but as I click it, you note that I get a very native checkbox here on the iOS. You also note that one of the things that FileMaker does is they have uh, one of the states is a dropped state. So you notice that as I move this icon, dragging it from here to here, I get FileMaker's default blue. Now I'm probably going to take care of that. But as I drag over to this container, watch what happens as I drag into that container. Note the little icon that's actually showing up right there and the fact that I'm completely changing the background based on this drop, showing you that you can actually give iconic representations. Now everything that you can do within CSS3 you can put into FileMaker, but you do not have access to that within um, FileMaker natively with its currently, as of FileMaker 12.0 v1, the, the 
current release of FileMaker, you don't have access to that. Look at this search box right here. When I click into this search box, notice I get the native Macintosh Glow, and as well I get this little icon for delete. Now there's a little problem with that. I can't click on this right now because the field being on top of the button is actually changing everything. If I click right here, you can see that I've got the little hand icon. If I click on that, then that would actually uh, delete. So it's a, it's a little bit kludgy in terms of how you do things, but you note that you can actually make things exactly the same way on most operating systems. Look at the pop-up that we have right here. This looks like a Mac pop-up. Look at the field right here. This looks like a Mac field. And when I click in, you notice that I get the highlight just like the Mac uh, field. Also note that when I go back over here, there are things that you can do with CSS that you can tweak such that this is a pop-up right here. So I'll go into layout mode and I will actually select this pop-up and drag it out, making it a much larger pop-up. But note that there is no text showing. So this is actually a pop-up field, but what I've done is I've turned off the display of the text. That doesn't mean that the pop-up itself won't display text, it just means that this field formatted as a pop-up when it is not selected will not show text, giving me the real nice feature of being able to leave that as a pop-up, being able to click on it, get my options, and then actually have it display how I want. So everything that you're going to do in your user interface, they're all based on all of these changes that we have in FileMaker Pro 12. So enough of showing off well, what we've got and what we can do. You want to know how it can be done. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to switch over to a web browser where I have Apple loaded and I just want to give you this because this was a discussion that was on a list somewhere where uh, somebody had mentioned that in FileMaker 12 they turned off the automatic hand hover icon. Well that's a good thing. It can be a very good thing. In case, uh, in fact, we're in a web browser here, and that's something, the, the floating hand is something that came about because of hyperlinks. And it's really pretty specific to the browser. And I wanted to draw a comparison, because if I switch over to iTunes, you're going to notice, as I bring that on screen, that when I'm moving through this interface, I will hardly ever, if ever, get that hand icon. So when it comes to native software, if you're designing something for the desktop, that hand icon does not show up in native software. What does show up is typically hovers or, at the very least, a pressed state. So even here on the, the selection, when I select, there is no indication other than the fact that I actually clicked on that item. Whereas in FileMaker, you can see right here, when I click, I actually get this reverse effect. Now my first tip is when working with FileMaker 12, if you're converting your solution, let me get the uh, distracting iTunes out of the background here, that FileMaker, because of the CSS, has basically made it such that each of the older objects that FileMaker formerly had, in fact let me go into layout mode and let me show this status area and then we'll scroll off to the side where I can actually make an object. So this object right here is in FileMaker language. Behind the scenes, it's a rect, just R-E-C-T. This right here is called an R-rect, or rounded corner rectangle. Right here, we have an oval, which can also be formed into a circle. You already know that. We have a line, and then, of course, we have all of our other objects, such as buttons. Now my reason for showing you this is the fact that many times when you're working with FileMaker, especially prior to 12, you would select an actual object, you would go up, and then you would define that as a button right here. Now that object defined as a button does not have all of the same properties as a true to real life button. And when it comes to the CSS behind the scenes, what's most important is that you have access to as much CSS as possible. That means that for a lot of objects that you had formerly defined, which were not actual buttons, you're going to want to redefine those as buttons so that you gain more features. Here's a good example. 
this area over here to the side where I have my sidebar, this is actually a multi-pane tab panel because I have different versions of my sidebar. When I go into browse mode, you can see that currently it's showing a full list mode. It's showing a list of all things. If I actually make a selection on an object, you can see that this area of collections has shown up at the bottom. That's because I've simply switched from one tab to another. Now those tabs are actually hidden by, and in the old way of doing things, you would use another tab panel. Well, this is no longer the case. With FileMaker 12 and its objects now, it's actually better to use a button with a pressed state that does nothing. So for example, when I click right here, I cannot click on any of those tab panel, those tab panes. When I go into layout mode and I move this off to the side, I'll select that object, move it off to the side, you can see right there that there are all of the tab panes. I've got L, A, C, T. And you can see that as I move through them, it's just different tabs that give me access. Now what I was able to do is I was able to create an object, which in this case, this is a button object. It's not a rectangle or a rounded rectangle, obviously not an oval defined as a button. It was an actual button, which I took, and then I simply changed the pressed state to be the exact same gradient as the normal and the hover state. So by using a button, what happens is the button receives the click before the actual tab pane behind the scenes. What do I assign to the button? Well, if we take a look, quite simply, I am using just a blank set variable. Now the reason for that is if you have scripts going on in your FileMaker solution, let's say one of which may be paused, you don't want to use an exit, you don't want to use a halt, you want to use something that's more or less innocuous. Setting a variable and setting that variable to nothing is your innocuous blocking script. So anytime you want to use hidden tab panes in FileMaker 12, you can do that by blocking the object with a button and then just setting it to some completely bogus little state. Now when it comes to things like we see right here with the little widget on the actual field, and in particular this object right here, what I want you to recognize again about a button is as I create a button here on the interface, and I'll just set its variable to nothing, what I want you to remember is that now in FileMaker 12, it really doesn't matter whether the object itself is a rectangle, a rounded rectangle, or a button. But with a button, as I've already mentioned, you get additional properties. You get the additional states, sometimes even if you don't use it as a button. But what you get is that any object can now have a corner radius. So it doesn't matter what it is. But in the case of a button such as this delete button, or such as my help icon right here, if the icon object itself, the clickable object, is something that is a circle, go ahead and set your corner radius to the exact same as what the object would be. When I click on this, you can see that it is currently, and this is all, by the way, stuff that I'm doing just with FileMaker's native inspector right off the bat. Making this little delete widget and making it look like a native delete widget is something that I simply did by setting a normal state version to a very light shade, or in case, in fact, this is actually a PNG which is, uh, it has translucency, or it's got an alpha channel, uh, alpha amount set to it. I did that in Acorn, and I'll show you some tricks in Acorn. But what happens is it doesn't matter whether this is over gray or moved over blue, which you can see in some of the other screens, but it basically looks like it's part of the row of what you're clicking. But when we take a look at the pressed state, or excuse me, the hover state, you can see that I'm simply using a darkened version of that. And that's simply a matter of darkening the gamma or increasing the contrast. But the way that I did that is I simply took a regular button. I knew that my original image, by taking a look at the position, was actually 13 pixels high. So all you have to do is take whatever object you're going to use, and you're simply going to make that the same height. So let's say it's 13 by 13 it starts off of a square, all I have to do is take that 13, obviously, and divide it. Now, I can't divide it equally, but, in fact, FileMaker does work with decimal versions or floating numbers within its point values now in its whole UI, something you typically want to avoid when you're positioning objects. 
but in the appearance, all I have to do is simply set a corner radius that's half of whatever. Now I'm going to set a corner radius of 5. And you'll see that that rounded corner button, actually let's bump it up to 6. But what was that square button is now the exact same dimensions of what my clickable object is. So if you really want to make your interface shine, what you're going to typically do is you're going to create three different states, or at least two. One is the normal, the other is the pressed, but if you want it to really look nice, you're going to do a normal, a hover, and a pressed, and the only thing you're going to do with the icons is you're going to make them slightly darker. And that's going to give you the really nice effect so that when you're in browse mode, and you hover over an icon, you get an indication that you are hovering over it. And then when you click it, you get a darker pressed version. So all I did in this case was I took my original icon, looked at its dimensions, created a regular button, set the corner radius to be half of the total height in order to give it the rounded so that when I press, but even when I press, the press itself is not inverting because I've injected an image that is the exact same image, just a darker version. Now if you want to see how I did that, I'll show you how I did it in Acorn really quickly. I'll just copy this object and then I'll open up Acorn. And it happens to be just a, a less expensive version of Photoshop. There are a lot of applications that you can get that will allow you to do things to objects. There's even free versions of applications that will do a lot of things in order to ma manipulate things within um, uh, manipulate your objects. Well what I'm going to do is I'm going to create another layer and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to fill that. Now I can't explain everything about image editing but I'm pretty sure that if you've used Keynote or anything else you get the concept of layers. Well in this case all that I did was I copied my original object from FileMaker Acorn actually happens to have a nice little uh, menu option on the Mac that says new from clipboard. So even though I copy it from anywhere, the web, the clipboard, whatever, I just come in here and I just do uh, command option in and it creates the document right there for me. Then I create a black layer on top and I can't explain blending options, all of these different options, what they do. Obviously, you can cycle through them, but in this particular application, I'm using source atop. You can see that basically, it just applies the black only to the object that was above. So the remainder of what I have to do here is simply set percentages. And what I tend to do is, if it's on a dark background, I will apply a 20% for the hover state and then I will apply a 40% for the press state and that's if it's on a dark background. That's because on dark you're really not going to see that much of a change so you want to show that it does get that much darker. So that's a 20% range. If it's on a light background then what I tend to do is I tend to apply that darkness a 10% amount and then the press state a 20% amount. So in this case, all I have to do is I already have the original object. I would, let's say I'm doing it over the dark. Uh, I would use the save for web right here. It would simply save the 20% version. When I save that, I would save it so that I actually, well, let's walk through the process. Let me just save this object right here. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to save this object. I'll do it to my desktop and I'll just call it uh, info button and then I save that. So now that it's saved as an info button dot corn, uh, acorn, all I have to do is do my web export, which I hit a command key, and then I click save. It's going to come up as the automatic name of what I named the document, and I just click save. Now I turn my, my cover over, it's 20%, and I just do that save as again, and I click save, and then I just hit the arrow key, and then I type hover. Now I just go in and I simply set my 40% amount, which makes it darker, and then I go in and I save, and I call this one pressed. So whatever the name of the iconic button you're going to be using is, use the root name, and then it is so easy to get this into FileMaker. You just go into FileMaker. Well, actually, let's go back over to Acorn. Let's see, that's a 48 by 48. I'm taking a look at the dimensions right there of what I copied. So in here, I simply go to this object, and I'm going to make it a... And you can sometimes increase it to 50 by 50, giving it extra pixels on the edge and making this a lot easier. And then I'll make a corner radius of 25. I'll now go into my normal state. I'll switch that to image. I will go to desktop excuse me, to my desktop. There's my info button JPEG. 
actually saved as a JPEG instead of a PNG. I want to turn off my line, set the line to none. I'll go to the hover state, and then I will choose an image for that, and that will be the hover. And then I will go to the pressed state, and then I will choose the pressed state. And done deal. Go into browse mode, and you can see, actually, I forgot to change the object. One of the things I forgot to change is I uh, forgot to change this to a, an original size, which will then center it. Now, when it comes to positioning, you have full control over positioning. You can position things to the left, to the right, on the top, on the bottom, anywhere. CSS all allows you to do this. It's the FileMaker Inspector currently, which does not allow you to do this. So as I uh, fix these up, yeah, in fact, look, what FileMaker does is it put... As soon as I made this selection of original size on the, um, it looks like this one's actually got a background of white, uh, probably because I did I exported it as a JPEG instead of a PNG. Uh, but you want to use PNG if you're supporting alpha channels. But what happens is with each of these, you have options on each of these states that is not presented here. As soon as I choose this original size, it makes it that way for all icons for the hover, for the pressed, and the normal state. But you need to realize you have full control using CSS to put one to the left, one to the right, one with borders, one without borders. I mean crazy amounts of control. You just don't have it here in the inspector. But you can see when I go into browse mode that I have this nice effect. There's my click. Uh, you know, obviously some things to clean up here, but you get the idea of what you're going to want to do in your interface. So what you probably want to know is how can I go beyond this point? This is all stuff I've done with FileMaker. How can I do things such as this? When I click here, I get this inverse and I get this shadow effect. How can I add icons directly onto objects so that those objects themselves, no matter where I go, that is always a little plus icon. How can I do things such as this portal, when I click on this portal row, excuse me, let's click on this one, you can see that there is a very subtle change where the actual highlight has gone a little bit darker, but the selection of the portal ray, uh, row isn't as dark as it normally is within FileMaker. And then I can use my arrow keys here using a script to move through this being able to move up and down. These are all the refinements and the tweaks. How is it that I'm able to put a tiled background here, but yet it actually has a gradient all the way down across, plus this nice little shadow in here, and yet when I go into layout mode, this is all one object, which, of course, I can simply adopt all of those properties by clicking this uh, copy-paste, absorbing those, and then watch what happens when I just select this rectangle, bring it on screen, and click Apply. Everything that was on that original object, including the tile that I had access to within the inspector, but as well the drop shadow and the gradient. So let's take a look at what I'm doing in the tweak tool, in the tweak aspect of FileMaker, and understand what's going on behind the scenes. All right, now in order to understand what's going on, we need to know that FileMaker 12, which we mo many of you already do know, that FileMaker, when they implemented themes, they did it using CSS. In fact, I'm going to open up FileMaker so that we can take a look at the difference between what I'm going to show you in the tweak tool of the Theme Studio and what you may have already experienced if you've even taken a look at FileMaker's themes. Now FileMaker, I don't know if they're going to support distributed themes. I think that they are. They're doing really well with bento themes, but we'll see how far they take it and what they do and also to what degree they give us access within the inspector to do certain things. I'm guessing, or I'm hedging my bet, that they won't go as far as you're going to be able to do to manipulate objects, at least if you're editing the direct CSS, which I've simply made easier using the tweak tool. So I'm going to open up, let's see, FileMaker, 
And there in FileMaker, all I did is I've opened up a window to the FileMaker Pro Advanced. I right click on that, I click Show Packages. I've done videos about this. This is nothing new. I'm going to go into Resources. I'm going to go into Themes. And these are all of the embedded themes. There is an external fo folder that's created within the Extensions folder that FileMaker looks at, where supposedly you might be able to put custom themes, but these are the hidden versions, things that they do not want you to touch, things that you should not hack, things that have, let's say, say for example, Onyx. I'll go into Onyx, and we have all of the different uh, multilingual versions. We have the images that are supported by the CSS file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this up. I'll um, uh, open it within Sublime, and we can take a look at the CSS, and we can do a uh, comparison between what a themed file is and what objects are layout objects in FileMaker. You can see right here that I've got field, baseline, field, drop target, self. I've got a title header, which is a body part. I've got a header, which is another body part. You can see that within this file, one thing in particular is this dot self class. Now what you need to know is that in FileMaker, we have a function called self. So everything that I'm going to be telling you from this point forward is a little bit of my own uh, suspicions or conjecture, but layout objects in the layout, once the, a theme has been applied to them, they stand alone. They are on their own. So for example, this header right here, well, it's actually a, a bad example. Let's find a button. The button object right there. In this particular theme, this button object, the normal state, the self of that button, in this case, this is what's known as a CSS class, the background image of this particular uh, button is a gradient, a WebKit gradient. It's also important to note that uh, FileMaker has ported Safari into the Windows version as well. They're not using an uh, IE native version of a gradient. They I believe, to the best of my knowledge, they have ported and they're rendering the WebKit gradient because they've embedded the engine for CSS rendering into FileMaker. Or, or, uh, that's my guess. Um, again, this is all conjecture because I'm not a uh, developer. Well, there's one thing that you need to know that we're going to see when we look at the tweak tool, and I know I've been taking a long time to get to it, but I want to make sure you understand what's going on, is that even though we have the states of normal, hover, pressed, on the object of a button, the self object is itself an object, but the inner border itself is another area where you can modify things. In fact, you can see here that in this case, they've added some padding, and they've also added a box shadow. This is what's actually giving you this effect right here. When you click on this object, you get that shadow. Or when you click in here, if I was to zoom in, you would be able to see that the inner line or the inner glow of this object is created because of an inset box shadow along with an outside box shadow. But that's because I have two actual CSS objects that I can work with. I have the outside object and then I have the inside object. So that's the first thing that you need to understand about the layout object. It's composed of at least a minimum of two objects. Those objects are self and then self inner border. The inner border is the other object. So what this does is it gives you some controls that you can now do things with CSS that FileMaker is probably not going to expose in the inspector. Again, that's a guess. They may expose that. But you already understand we've got the focus, the hover, and all these other states. So within this theme file, what they have is they have all of these different things that are defined for all of the different native things that you're familiar with. Those include everything that you see in layout mode, including text, line, rect, rect, oval, uh, portals, buttons, tabs. Tabs are broken up into the overall pane plus each individual tab. Web viewers and charts are they are sort of they stand out on their own the way that they are defined in terms of layout objects. And then you have all other parts, which is the body part, the header part, the footer part, and so on. Now, anything that's specific to FileMaker that doesn't have to do with the rendering of the object 
is actually a FileMaker control. So when I double click on this portal, and you can see this little option right here of alternate background fill, reset scroll bar when exiting, um, filter, allow deletion, show vertical, all of these different options that are specific to FileMaker also came along within the CSS in terms of what FileMaker applied. This is quite obvious because if you go into this file and you scroll to any point where you get to some non-looking standard CSS, you can see right here that the dash FM dash text dash vertical line, which is a non-standard CSS object or CSS property, I should say, that's something that's specific to FileMaker. So what it's telling FileMaker is the normal version of the button on that object, we're going to have a border width of one, the border style is going to be solid, the border radius is five points, here's the font family we want to use, the font style, color, font, everything, all the rest of this is native standard CSS, except for the gradient, which is Safari specific, but I said already it's being converted over in Windows. But you have this FM text. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over, finally, and we are going to take a look at any object. In fact, I will take, well, what's most fun are buttons. I'm going to copy this object to the clipboard. I'm going to go into browse mode, and I'm going to go over to my tweak area. Now, in my tweak area, which you'll have to excuse me as a little bit of a hack, but you can see that I've got the options of get clipboard and set clipboard. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the clipboard, and what's going to happen is it's going to parse through the actual object itself. You can see that the object right there, I'm listing all of the objects that were found on the clipboard. So what this actually implies is if I go back over to the icons area and I go into layout mode, and if I select this portal inclusive of every one of these fields, all of the buttons, the icons, everything, and I copy that, all of that was copied to the actual clipboard, including all objects, not just the portal. That's because how FileMaker 12 is now treating objects. When I go back into browse mode, or if I had another window open, opened onto the tweak tool, if I click the get clipboard, you're going to see that I'm giving a prompt, that this is a long process. That's because there is a lot of CSS anytime you go beyond a certain number of objects. So in this case, I'm saying I have a total of 16 objects. And I click, I could click OK, and it will actually process all of those objects. Now what's great about the tweak tool is the tweak tool takes everything that is on that object, including tooltips, conditional formatting, um, anything that has to do with code that's on the object, I'm not messing with that in the tweak tool. Everything stays exactly as is. But what I expose is I expose the ability to manipulate individual objects. In fact, here's a capture that I had done previous, previously of the icons portal. You can see right here, that I have all of those objects, including the delete, the click, whatever, and you get a listing of all of the objects, the portal, the rect, the text, the button, and as I scroll down, I've got field, field, field. Each one of these fields are these fields, and they're all captured based on the stacking order of the objects. So for example, if this particular field represented this smaller field on this portal, and I wanted to change the drop target shadow or glow on this one object, I would be able to do that. But let's go back to something that's super simple. Let's go back to my capture of just my button. You can see right here that the button itself, when I imported the image, that image was converted. And as opposed to what we saw over here, where the CSS file, according to the theme, is defining here is a button object, here is its state, here is the class of self, you can see that in the tweak tool, what we actually have is we have everything that was converted. It's now no longer button uh, hover, it is now self hover, self pressed, self dot inner border. So what this means is that there are classes or there are attributes to objects that FileMaker does not automatically put on that you can put on if you want to. Remember, there are multiple 
different states. Let's see if this uh, it's going to render because it's a button. It's not as fun. Let me see if I can go to regular button so that we can get a good example. Um, normal button. There we go. Let's see if that renders. Um, what we can do is you can see right here we've got a self, which is the normal state, a self-pressed, a self-focused. There is currently not a self-hover on this particular object. Now the easy way to add this would be to go over to the layout that I'm working on, simply use the inspector and apply the hover. But there's no reason that I can't do that right here. In fact, I can click the little plus. You can see that I create a self unset. Let's say, for example, I wanted to do a self pressed inner border. Now granted, you have to learn a little bit about what you can and can't add because it has to be something that FileMaker can recognize. But because I know that the self-pressed state is a state of a button, and I know that the inner border is the second uh, CSS object. So the first CSS, ob CSS object on a button is self. The second object is self.inner border. That means that on the pressed state, I can do an inner border. And what this second object gives you access to is it gives you access to things that are, let me clear my property setting right here, like on self, we have a background image property. Now you can only have one background image property per attribute, but I have two objects. If I click on inner border, I have a background image property there as well. So that's exactly how I got my tiled effect right here where I applied a, uh, a gray, uh, excuse me, a tiled object that is a pattern for the background, but then I also applied a gradient which is very subtle over the top. So that was all done by having access to this tweak tool, being able to add additional properties and being able to tweak the individual properties themselves. You can see that on the self state, I've got this nice little search tool that if I put in, for example, border and type, it's going to come up, and let me drag this out so we can see more of what's going on with all the different properties. We can see that I've got the top, the right, and the bottom color. Now what I've also included into the tweak tool of the Theme Studio 12 is I've included the ability to make bulk applications. And one thing that I want to also work on is being able to copy from one object to another. For example, if I wanted to select border, right, bottom, and color, and then copy all of those, go over to another object and apply all of those, then certainly I can do that. And of course, remember, in FileMaker, you always have access, no matter what the object is, to simply click the state or click the style to adopt it. And then you can just create another object, for example, right here. And it's going to take, and I'll set this to a set variable, it's going to take everything that was on that clipboard, including the image. So let's take a look at images because that's a really interesting one. The, um, we'll actually filter out image. And here's a great thing about the tweak tool is I can move to all of the different states here and actually see whatever the filter is filtering. So if I want to see uh, the border state on an, a particular object, I can load that I can go from self and I can go from self to inner border. And I can see that the inner border itself does not have any borders that are showing. One, because the translucency within this RGBA is set to zero, which means it's not even going to show anything. I can also see that the style of the line is none. And I can see that the actual dimension is zero or the setting. But I've made these little widgets or these little options that make it easier to make bulk changes. So if, for example, the border top color, I can individually change that or the bottom, something I don't have control of in FileMaker, by simply selecting and then applying those. And what you're going to see is you're going to see is it will render the top and bottom there. In fact, what we need to do is let's set the two side borders by turning the top and bottom off, let's set those to have a uh, thicker width so that we can really see the uh, difference. Um, let's actually make that really big because my video isn't going to represent things as quickly. But there we go, we can see that we're rendering the top and bottom. Now, if on the case of any one of these particular states, the pressed, the focused, uh, hover isn't even represented. You can see, in fact, that the hover inherits, everything inherits down. Uh, they get it from the normal. If they can't get it from the one above, then they use whatever they have available. But each and every 
uh, different attribute of the self, self-press, self-hover, self-focus. Uh, those are all things that you can control. Then you have self, self-hover, inner border, self-pressed inner border, self-focus inner border. Many times these are not actually on objects by default, even in FileMaker's own themes, but they are things that you can set onto objects. So for example, if I set all of these on the self object and let's say I select this and go to uh, dashed. In fact, I'm actually listing CSS3 properties that you don't necessarily have that FileMaker may not be rendering, such as the groove. They may be doing the outset versus the inset, which creates the old familiar um, FileMaker embossed look, but they definitely have the dashed and the dotted. So if you ever have any questions when you're using the theme studio, when I release that, then what you're going to do is you're going to go over to the inspector, see what FileMaker offers, and if it doesn't show up when you actually apply it here to the CSS, then that's what you're going to get. But more or less, I think you get the idea of what is possible here behind the scenes far, far more than FileMaker is actually giving you instant access to. Now, the really great thing about the tweak tool is that I've made it so that you can revert things. In fact, if I wanted to revert this whole object, you can see that I've got this little icon right here where I can click to revert to the original setting. I can either do that on any one of the individual properties themselves, or I can actually um, revert the whole object or revert, or excuse me, revert the whole uh, attribute settings, all properties for a given attribute, as well as the whole object. You're also going to see as I scroll down here, actually let's go to an ob, uh, a setting where they, I don't have an editor. I'm building little editors to try to make this whole process easier so that you can always preview what you're going to get before you go out. But remember, FileMaker is always the final authority. If you click set clipboard, which I can click right now, and I go into layout mode, and then I click and I paste, wherever that pasted, where did it paste? Um, one thing you need to remember, there it is, all the way over there. One thing you need to remember is that, and you can see it's got all those different attributes, got my nice thick uh, dashed, and it's got, you know, everything. Look at that, oh, just a really funky, weird button that you would not be able to create with FileMaker's native inspector. Um, the one thing you need to remember is that FileMaker is the final authority. When you go into FileMaker, it will, if it doesn't understand the CSS, it may override it, it may just ignore it, I don't know. But there are things in here that they are applying that don't always make sense on objects. Let me clear right here so we can take a look and see what we've got. As I scroll down here, you can see that we're coming up to a point where we get um, a certain number of properties. That's because by default, I will be hiding all of the properties that you may not need to actually access through this particular tool, just because FileMaker doesn't do anything with them currently. But they are supporting all CSS3, and it looks like they're putting on a lot of defaults. But you can see right here, I have this option of show all properties, and I also have this little option of use raw editor. So for any time that I don't have an editor, such as I do right here with the border. So I've got this little editor for doing bulk changes on this particular attribute of this object and setting the color for any side that I select and so on. But if there's a, uh, an object that I don't have a setting for, because I turned on the use raw editor option, I'm able to go in and directly edit the CSS right here. So for example, CSS doesn't like it. If there's no space and it can't see it, it won't be able to parse it. So it's very possible that you could do something that would crash your FileMaker. That's why I'm giving a very clear notice that you are editing the raw CSS because I'm not able to ensure that you're actually going to make this in a format that FileMaker likes. But more or less, all you have to do is follow the format that, th that is there natively. And you'll have to learn what you can do with regards uh, to objects. Uh, for example, this right here is actually a an improper object right here. This inset setting on this particular object should not be there. The inset really only applies to a box object, but clearly it worked because I had set the clipboard and actually pasted it into the layout. So it uh, didn't find a problem with that. So that's what I have coming with the Theme Studio, and that's what's going on behind the scenes. Just knowing the difference between what is in a theme style or what's in a theme 
the, of the CSS and how it gets applied to the layout. Now there's one last thing that I'm going to leave you with and that is there are things that are put onto an object. And remember, as I stated in the beginning, once an object has its CSS, it stands alone. That object is itself. It's only when and if you apply a theme again does FileMaker walk through all of the objects on a layout and then apply the CSS that's coming from the theme uh, outside of FileMaker and overwrites any custom settings. But of course you can do a command Z, a command Z or control Z and just back up one step and all custom formatted objects will go back to their custom state, which is a really nice thing to know. But the last thing that I was going to leave you with, what was it? I was, let me think. Uh, I, th I think I remember what it is. I was going to tell you about uh, images, I believe. Images and also the fact that when you copy an object or objects off of the clipboard, into this solution, everything is remembered, the positioning and, and so on. For example, if I go into layout mode and I select this object, which that one actually is a, an outline, let's say, let's select, well, that's a web viewer. Let's click this button. So I, if I clip this button or co uh, select it, copy it, go back into browse mode, get the clipboard, tweak the button, and then go back into layout mode, if I do nothing and I paste it, it will paste into the exact same coordinates because the clipboard remembers that without having selected something. If I click in a location and then paste, I've updated or sort of told FileMaker, I want you to paste this somewhere else. And then again, it's not always precise. It doesn't go directly under your cursor. But what I want, I, the reason for telling you that is that as you're tweaking objects, for example, a lot of times you'll take a portal and you don't want to take everything apart. You just want to copy the portal and take it inclusive of everything that's in it and then just tweak one of those objects within what you copy. If you go back into layout mode, click in that same relative area, delete, and then simply paste, what happens is your tweaked object gets pasted right in place of where your object is supposed to be. Now it doesn't, it messes up a little bit on the layout order, but for the most part, it's really uh, pretty nice. The other thing that I want to leave you with is the background images. You can see that when I click on this, I do have an editor. And what's really nice that I mentioned is that you have control over putting these images in wherever you want. Now this is just a container and I can click and I can right click and I can choose insert picture. In fact, I can go get my, uh, my info button right here and I can insert that and what will happen is FileMaker and if I click on my object right here it doesn't automatically uh, render that object. You can see right here that it's doing the tiling. This is the setting that FileMaker has where all of those objects uh, are you know, they basically do things based on the inspector. Well you have to know that that is a repeat setting right here. So if I say I have to go in and there's some CSS that you sort of have to know if you're going to use this raw editor. Um, I would still need to develop my native editor, but now by saying no repeat on both the X and the Y, most everything in CSS is an X, Y type of coordinate. You can see that I've now got it at a background position of zero, zero. And while my editor isn't finished here, what I do know is that I would be able to say, for example, um, I'll use the raw editor, change this to, um, this is the X coordinate, and then you have the Y coordinate. So within the Y, if I put that at 50%, and I leave this at relatively, let's say, 3%, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have an object that is more or less centered vertically, but is pushed off of the edge a little bit. And now when I say uh, set clipboard, go into layout mode and let's say click and then paste. What you're going to see is you're going to see that I've integrated that image into this actual button. The image itself is part of the button. We can see that FileMaker is rendering this image right here because of the fact that I would be able to change this image by setting a background color or let's say setting a gradient. But watch what happens if I go over to FileMaker or excuse me, go into browse mode. And remember those two objects that I was talking about? I'm going to select on this right here. I'm going to select all of this content. I'm going to go to the inner border object, click on the image property, paste that. 
I'm going to have to modify the background position. I'm going to do 3% a space 50%. I'm going to select on the background repeat and I'm going to do a no repeat and a no dash repeat. And I'm going to, do I have, uh, I probably don't have one. I'm going to borrow from one of my other objects. Let's see. I'm going to filter based on background and I'm going to cycle through a couple of different objects until I find, there we go, there's a background image right there with some WebKit gradient. So there's a gradient. And there's my normal button. And so now on myself, I will simply select that and I will paste all of this and then I will render pre-render that object. So you can see sort of what I'm going to get. This is something you cannot do within FileMaker's Inspector. I'll set the clipboard and that's because when I paste this object you're going to see that I do have my graphic object there as well as my gradient. Now when I select the object you can see that the inspector is showing me that I have a graphic fill gradient but because I know that there are two objects, I have that access to that inner border, I was able to set the image on the inner border giving me much more control than I have natively right here through the inspector. I can embed things like buttons such as I've done right here with this object where I'm able to give myself a drop shadow uh, inset when pressed on the inner border and show gradients and show all kinds of different states so that things really look pretty cool when you start to design your FileMaker layouts to the hilt. Now the cool thing is, is because I'm working directly with objects and because I'm working directly with CSS, I'm not actually violating anything that FileMaker is having to say about creating custom themes. And that is because I'm directly manipulating the objects. So unless FileMaker was to completely abandon CSS, they're probably going to respect most of the tweaks that are done. But you do need to know that FileMaker does reserve the right to actually change those. And again, about those specific FM properties. There are some things you can see right down here at the bottom that I've got this FM table background color, FM portal alt background, false, FM body alt background, false. You can see that in the case of this particular object, a button, the FM body dash alt background uh, property does not make sense. A button is not the alternating body part. But I happen to know that this basically is the CSS tag of a true false Boolean value of whether or not the body part itself, going over here to the body part, is checked right there. So they're applying some properties, as you'll see in the Tweak Cool tool, onto all objects. They may do some cleanup and get rid of some. They may uh, automatically default or reset some. So any tweaks that you do with the Tweak tool, you need to know, just like FileMaker is not advising custom themes, you could potentially run across a situation that when you go from FileMaker V1 to V2 or V whatever, that some subtle changes happen. As long as you're prepared for that, I'm pretty confident that no matter what changes they make, unless they abandon CSS, you're going to be able to tweak to your heart's content and then go in and maybe you have to touch up some objects based on changes that they make. But all we have to do is keep on top of whatever changes they make. And we have the ability to do some really cool things in our FileMaker databases. So that is my super long, we are obviously at an hour plus or whatever, explanation of what is going on behind the scenes. I wanted to give you as much insight and knowledge that I have about this, not only because I'd like you to be interested in the Theme Studio tool and be able to do this, because of course, everything that I've shown you, you can do with a FileMaker clipboard tool. You can go in and you can do a find and replace across whatever is copied onto the clipboard. And there are free clipboard plugins. All I've done is I've simply made it easier and I've made a singular place where you can store things within this theme studio, including layouts, objects, managing colors, giving you a little bit of project management via collections and so on. But just as long as you remember that 
what we're doing here is something that is behind the scenes and is available. It's just not currently presented in FileMaker. You shouldn't be afraid to use this. In fact, I'm not because the whole of my Theme Studio interface has a bunch of highly tweaked objects. And we will see what happens when FileMaker releases new VREB. So I may have to tweak my tool and change some things, but that's all right. I'll just push it out and make a new one. Also, one thing I wanted to give you a heads up about is in the icon section, and because within the tweak tool, when you are actually working with a particular object, excuse me, integrating an actual image, you're going to see that, as I hold on control to click that, you're going to see that what happens is FileMaker converts all of its images into what's known as Base64. So this is not something that you're supposed to be afraid of. What happens is if you use the native editor, I'm automatically doing the conversion for you in order to get all that Base64. It's basically all the uh, computerish looking code that actually represents what the image is uh, supposed to be. And you of course want to keep this as small as possible. So you want to optimize these images, keeping them very trim and lean. But over in the icon section, what you're going to notice is that the icon builder, no matter what the icon is, if I go in and delete an object or if I'm using the icon builder for the purpose of combining objects, which is what it was designed to do, it will render all of the base64 version of the icon that is down here at the bottom. So after I've finally positioned this icon down here how I want it, let's say with the little truck down there, and let's say I'm going to make it grayscale and I'm going to uh, make it a little bit, uh, let's increase the transparency and set the brightness right there. I can then take all of this you just need to remember that the Icon Studio is actually doing a PNG file. I can copy all of that Base64, go over to my Tweak tool, and then actually select this image uh, data right here. And the image MIME type is PNG. So this is really technical stuff that you need to know about. Um, it's not a JPEG. And the, the name itself doesn't actually... Uh, isn't super important. It can be, you could put anything like, you can put blah.png. But everything after this last little comma, if I scroll all the way down, let's scroll and then just select and delete, everything within here, all that base64 code is all the conversion that was done when I initially dragged or pasted the container into the uh, editor based on the image. But because I was over in the icons layout, I do give the base64 code so that I can just paste that in. And now when I set the, I can render this object, you can see that it now rendered my object and I can set the clipboard and here we go. So basically using the custom uh, creation of the icons, I'm able to create or uh, copy that base64 code and give myself a version. Now, the, uh, <laughs> there's so much stuff that, I've, that I'm giving you here. Hopefully, uh, this isn't too long for you. Uh, remember that FileMaker is only exposing one of the two, sometimes there may be more objects, but for the most part, there's two. They're not exposing access to the inner border, but I wanted to give you uh, this little bit of knowledge. You can see that when I select this, this gradient fill is on the outside object. The actual icon itself is on the inside object, the dot inner border class of the self object. When I use conditional formatting on this object, and I'm going to use, for example, the, the fill color, setting it to transparent, which is a very great tip, because what happens is, FileMaker, when you set an object to be transparent, for example, if I add and I say formula is true, and I set the fill color to be completely translucent, meaning you're going to be able to see straight through that, it only applies as we'll see right there, you can see that the gradient went away, but the graphic still stays there. It does not apply to the secondary object, the inner border. It applies to the background or the primary object. So if you're working with things where you do want a gradient and you want to be able to hide show the image on an object, you're going to have to work with two objects. That is putting one behind with a gradient and then one on top. And what I really like about the CSS is it is um, highly, highly optimizing our layouts by being able to do uh, a lot of things. In fact, going into layout mode, for example, uh, these buttons used to be 
the image with a button overlay. Now it's just the button. Uh, these portal rows, in order to show the um, selected state, in order to show the different gradients, it used to be a container behind the actual field, sometimes with a button overlaid on top of that. Or, you know, you'd have three objects stacked on top of each other in order to do one thing. That is not the case anymore. This is a portal. This is a merge field. It's also been defined as a button, but it also has the gradient. It can have a pressed state, and it can also use conditional formatting as to whether or not it should or should not show that gradient. Layouts in FileMaker 12 are a dream come true. It is a reason alone to convert. Now, if you are converting solutions and you're recognizing some slowness, it's very, very likely because there are a lot of different things going on. Some of them FileMaker may fix. But what I've noticed is as I've taken a couple of months to revise the whole theme studio and make it truly a FileMaker 12 native solution, it gets zippier as you optimize all of your different objects, especially when you optimize all of your different gradients and heavy sized images and so on and so forth. If you are going to DevCon, I'm looking forward to showing you uh, not everything that I showed you here. In fact, everything that I showed here is everything that I'm probably not going to be able to or will only be able to show small portions of at my DevCon session here in 2012. All the rest of what I'm going to, to discuss is things talking about how to actually arrive at this type of design or solution, how to make your solution look really nice so that when you're moving through the solution, it feels uh, very comfortable and, and very nice. You do things like the, what we have right here where I've got the pressed state, but I'm alternating these rows and uh, using gradients and doing things which really makes this solution feel a lot more professional. So I've gone on and on about what you're able to do, and hopefully this video will help you um, find out what you can do in FileMaker 12, help you improve your layouts. As always, I'm wishing you much luck with your own development in FileMaker, and until next time, happy FileMaking.